white spots. It was Sam's turn now to open the door with the rose-painted china panel. It was Sam's turn, too, by the very power of his calmness, to compel the grizzled, ruddy-faced man with the quivering upper lip to go out into the hall. Down the passage they walked together, and together they entered the museum. Here, in the presence of the familiar aquarium, the familiar iron candlesticks, the familiar drogotypes, the father and son faced each other. <clears throat> Neither of them sat down, and there was indeed little attraction about the few fading coals in the grate. Matt Decker had evidently been too absorbed in his thoughts to keep his fire up, to lure them to sit down, but the father on the right of the fireplace, with his hand on the mantelpiece, and the son on the left with his hand on the mantelpiece, confronted each other like two duelists. Grail Aquarium Aquarium Grail ran like a refrain through Sam's head, and he began suddenly to feel again that queer sensation he had felt in the drawing room, a sensation like that of the presence of a double world, every motion and gesture in the first being a symbol of something that was taking place in the second. The sensation was accompanied by an absolute conviction of the boundless importance of every thought that a human being had. It was also accompanied, strange though it may seem at this tragic moment, by a faint thrill of mysterious happiness, the first authentic leap of spontaneous happiness in him that poor Sam had known for many a month. He glanced round at the aquarium as his father began speaking, and now sarcastic cry, Your precious aquarium! transmuted itself into a spasm of sweetness that was like a prolongation of what he had felt just now when he pressed her to his heart. It is, it's against all I've believed, this damned business of divorce, burst out Matt Decker fiercely. But the church has always retained the right to deal with special conditions in special ways, and with this brute over there behaving as he is. The man's formidable upper lip began quivering again, and Sam noticed that there was a blood stain upon the white clerical tie, then the old fashioned evangelical manner this eccentric high churchman wore around his muscular neck. His hand must have shaken when he was shaving, thought Sam. Jesus, give me strength not to get angry. With that brute like he is, and doing it openly, turning her out, in fact, I can make short work of him. I shall go and see John Beer this afternoon. It's not a thing, he made an automatic humorous grimace of disgust, that I like doing. All lawyers are rogues. But it's what I'm going to do, and I'm going to do it willy-nilly as far as she's concerned. She shan't be worried with it till I've got the thing well underway. He looked so pathetically proud of himself in that display of world, worldly sagacity before his simple and blundering son that Sam felt a stab of remorse at having broken up their life and brought all these things down on that gray head. I wouldn't do that, father, he cried. I wouldn't tell Beer, or anyone else, a word about it unless she asks you to. How do you know that she wants to divorce him? Women are funny in these things. Oh, I know, I know she wouldn't like it for you to do that without telling her. Besides, Father, I don't believe that Mr. Beer would even discuss it unless she came herself. They always have to go themselves. That's how it is in the newspapers. They have to go to court. That's why they hate it. They can't bear to go to court. Mr. Decker began striding up and down the floor of the museum. He seemed irritated by his clerical dress at this crisis in his life. What he would really have liked to do was to go out to White Lake and challenge Zoyland to a bout of fisticuffs, then have it out with his son. He could not quite have explained what form the scene would have taken. And then, and it was this and then, that was the whole crux of the situation. In his passion and in his professional and religious restrictions, this sturdy son of the Quintox looked like a caged wild animal as he paced back and forth. His feelings were expressed in the way he hitched up his long broadcloth coattails so as to thrust his hands into his pockets, and the way he let these tails hang over and over each wrist as he walked up and down. To ruffle his priest attire was a small gesture. 
but it belonged to the same category of jesters as is ordering the girl to go up to her baby and is telling Sam about his resolve to visit Lawyer Beer. The best thing you can do to them, he brought out now, standing still by the edge of the aquarium, into which even as he spoke he could not help giving a sidelong glance. The best thing you can do is to take her to Beer yourself. You'll have to be, what's the word, correspondent, of course. That is, if he brings a countersuit in on his side, as I have no doubt the beggar will. Once more, Sam was aware of a pathetic note of self-complacency in his father's tone. The old man, he thought to himself, is proud of his worldly knowledge. He thinks I've never heard the words correspondent of countersuit. Christ, don't let me get angry with him. The moment had come when he had to tell his father what was in his mind. But it was a fearful wrench to utter the words, and it would be a worse thing for his father when he heard them. I, he had come to it. He never thought he would, but he had. He had to tell his father that he was going to leave him. Sam knew much better than did the gray-haired man hunched up in his coattails. What it would mean to both of them, this separation. Of course, he thought, I shall be still in Gladstonbury, but it'll be the end of our real life together. It'll be the end of our long evenings in this room. I'll be the end of our mornings in the potato garden. You know more than the law things I do, father, he remarked, but he said it only to gain time. And I certainly should not draw back from helping her in any way I could. His father's hands came out of his pockets now, and one of them was thrust into the aquarium. He had caught sight of something there that Sam, at any rate, had never seen in the aquarium. No, not since as a small child he had watched his father changing its water and its weeds. There was now three kinds of weeds in the aquarium, two of them river weeds, and one of them a pond weed. And it was in an entanglement of this pond weed that Mad Decker had found what was such a shock to him and that what, at any other time, would have been an event of the first importance in Glastonbury Vicarage. He had found a dead fish. Dead! One of the mere rise ones, muttered Matt Decker now, holding out the tiny little corpse for Sam to see. It looked very small indeed in the priest's great brown palm, very small and silvery, like an atom vagula, bladula, in the hand of God. That's what it is, one of the mere rise ones, echoed Sam. We didn't change the water yesterday, said his father. Nor the green weed last week, added Sam. And we left that duckweed, said his father, when we knew it ought to come out. <clears throat> and we never got that fresh gravel from Kenton Mandelville, sighed Sam. Or a trowel full of that sand we saw at Athelie, groaned his father. It's our own fault that the minnow's dead, said Sam. We've killed it, echoed the vicar of Glatzenbury as surely and certainly as if we'd fished it out and thrown it into the fire. Put it here, said Sam, hardly bringing from the chimney piece a little copper plaque with the head of St. Dustin engraved on it. Mr. Decker tipped the little fish from his hand into the center of this plate, where it lay across the sullen brow of the despotic ecclesiastic. Let's see what happens to it now, murmured Sam, tossing some drops of water out of a tumbler and covering up the fish. "'What'll happen to all of us, my boy?' sighed his father, sinking into one of the creaking wicker chairs while Sam took possession of the other. They surveyed each other in silence, and a moment passed during which they knew, those two heavily breathing, staring men, that would take more than the maddening breasts of that sweet creature upstairs, suckling her child, really to separate them, the one from the other.' But Sam pulled himself together. It was not for the sake of peace with his father that he had to go. It was not even because Nell had said, If you can stand the way we're living, I can't. It was because, without question or doubt or any compromise, his external soul had commanded him to leave this house. He drew in his breath several times before he spoke, 
inhaling with it that old familiar smell of his father's workroom that seemed as much composed of some wholesome emanation from the priest's massive animal frame as from the fumes of his pipe and the musty odor of the leather bindings of Mr. Dr. Simeon's sermons. I've got something to tell you, Father, he said. Eh, yeah, boy, speak up. Out with it. The tone was identical with the tone which Sam had heard from him when, on leaving Cambridge, he had announced that he could not be ordained. But somehow, hearing it now, it put him back into the Yatin collar of his first term at the Shepburn Prep. Don't interrupt me then, Father, please, and I'll tell you. Oh, these deadly pauses, these creaking of chairs, these swallowings of saliva, when the outer coat of the human stomach seems to be inflating and deflating itself like the belly of a frog. I've decided to leave this house, Father, and take lodgings for myself in the... His words became pattering out, tit-tat, tit-tat, tit-tat. Like the tread of the Grey Land's Kedic corpse, who, when commanded to advance at quick time. In the town somewhere, and earn my own living. I want to earn it as a working man, and I'm pretty sure I can get a job that wouldn't take me much time to learn at this new municipal factory. I understand that, no, don't interrupt me, Father, that there are several places unfilled there, because they can't find enough people to take some poor wages. This won't mean my becoming a socialist or anything like that. They're ready to take anyone. And they know I'm not interested in politics. I'm going round to that tribunal this afternoon to talk to this new lawyer they've got, this nephew of old Mary's, and when I've got my job, can you guess where I'm going to live, Father? No, stop. Let me tell you. I'm going to live in the attic of that old warehouse with the Gothic door that we're so often noticed when we've started on our walks towards Mir. You spoke of it yourself, don't you remember? That day we took our lunch and got as far as Baudrup. He stopped breathlessly. Well, it was now done. He had crossed his Rubicon. He had severed that animal male link, stronger in some ways even than the umbilical cord itself, which had bound him so long, hirsute flesh against hirsute flesh, to his begetter. He didn't dare to look at his father now. He raised his head and stared at the aquarium. It was Nell's chance word that had suddenly made his path so clear, just as it had been Crummy's chance word reported to him by Rudd Robinson that had started the whole thing. Girls' words, tossed out without thought. They've changed my whole life, he said to himself. I said goodbye to her in Mother's room, and now... He jumped to his feet, lurched forward and clutching his father's forehead in both his hands, bent down over it and kissed it. And now, he added, in his deepest heart, I've said goodbye to him in our room. After kissing his father's bent head, for Matt Decker, as if under the blinding glare of his enemy the sun, had lowered his face and closed his eyes, Sam walked to the door. As he put out his hand to its handle, he seemed to see the whole of his life as nothing but doors. Study doors, drawing room doors, church doors, privy doors, kitchen doors, bedroom doors. Sam! His father went on his feet, straightening his shoulders, tightening his lips, fumbling blindly with his heavy gold watch chain. The priest's thoughts and feelings at that moment were incoherent to a point of physical distress. They were like a whirlpool. Tossing up opposite things, drowned bodies, rabbiting sharks, shimmering mother of pearl, cowrie shells, dogfish from the bottom of the mine's deep sea. Alone in the house with her, going past her bedroom, alone with her, Sam leaving me, Sam going out of my house, Sam's place empty. Being the man he was, it was natural enough that this distress caused to him by the conflicting nature of his thoughts vented itself in a rational anger. Sam! Yes, father? You shan't sneak off like this. Do you hear me? I say you shan't, leaving your wench and your child and everything. Have you no natural feeling at all? You promised me you'd let her alone until she was properly divorced and you were properly married to her. And what do I find? I find you turning your mother's room into a place to... 
The trick had worked. The man's upper lip was once more protruding and trembling with injury and grievance. Into a place to fornicate in! The ugly word belched itself forth from the priest's contorted mouth like the dark wine and the goblets of human flesh from the guts of the drunken Polyphemus. How could Sam now know that the secret urge of this anger was a wild, heathen delight at being left alone, alone with a rival, with those suckling breasts upstairs? How could Sam know that it was the man's own, I'd like to Susie, I'd like to Dolly, I'd like to Nellie, of the stone-throwing Tommy Chinook that was being lambasted and foul-tamed by the bewildered priest. Mother Ledge would have been the person to have set Sam right about this riddle of his father's wrath, though doubtless Mr. Evans, who had, been the con who had seen the contents of the camel bowl touch Nell's lips before all the rest, might have been able to instruct even the wise Mother Leg about the maddening power of this girl's fatal passivity. A bundle she was, that was it. An aphrodisiac bundle of cloves, cinnamon, and aniseed. A fever-raising, fever-allaying bundle of catnip. For one, two, three, and how many more? Prowling, feral carnivores. And there was, after all, for Sam was his father's son, a similar introversion of righteous anger on Sam's side. Why else should the world word used by his father and associated by his father with the room of the dumb clock have made him his chin work so and spurt of black anger almost choke him. If he hadn't forgot anything, everything, even that it was the last time, when he hugged Nell so furiously in the drawing room, this ward of his father's would doubtless have gone over his head like a badly aimed duck shot. It was certainly the word fornication that led Sam now, for after all he was a very young saint, to close this door of all doors, with so resounding a repercussion throughout the whole house, that Nell, doing up the front of her dress, after nursing her baby, ran quickly to the door of Williams of Orange's room, opened it, and listened in fright and concern. It was in this manner that Sam Decker was heard leaving the house of his birth, which he had entered through the body of the servant from Geneva some twenty-five years ago. And what was the first thing that Matt Decker did when he heard his son cross that hall, open the front door, and go out? He moved slowly to the mantelpiece, removed the tumbler that Sam had placed over the little fish from mere rye, picked it up from its place above the surly continents of St. Dunstan, and, raising it to his nostrils, snuffed at it with inquisitive interest. Meanwhile, Sam himself, arrived in the presence of Paul Trent in the abbot's tribunal, soon found that he was completely right about there being no lack of communal jobs as long as he was content with the barest living wage. And since such a wage, just enough to keep body and soul together, was exactly what suited his life illusion just then, both parties in the transaction were speedily rendered of content. And so, so before that day was over, both Mr. Decker and Nell received brief notes from this quixotic young man, notes that were delivered in person, for he had no desire that Penny and Mr. Weatherwax should sauce, sauce their favorite Gorlis with his emotional confidences, telling them of his success. The two devoted boys, Elfin Cantle and Steve Lou, were Sam's messengers. Steve's hero worship for Elfin had begun during this last few months to reproduce almost exactly Elfin's for Sam. And the mission of this sort being meat and drink to such romantic lads... The recipients of these missives received them privately, separately, faithfully, and in all due secretly before night fell. Matt Decker's note ran, Dearest Father, You can always find me in case of necessity at the top of that house I spoke of. They call it the old malt house, and it is in the middle of Manor House Lane. I'll see you, of course, before long, but for a week or two I want to collect my thoughts. Give my love to Penny. Your affectionate son, Sam. P.S. I've got a good job, so I am in no need of money. P.P.S. Would you mind telling Penny to give the bearer my big sponge? <laughs> the note to Nell, which was, it was Steve's task to deliver, Sam had tack enough to make this quite clear, ran as follows. 
Nell, my little Nell, you must forgive me if I hide away from both you and father for a week or two. I am all right. I am not unhappy. If I've made you unhappy, please, please try to forgive me. I needn't tell you any more about my religion and my new life. But I have to tell you this, once and for all, that I love you more than I ever did. Now you may smile in the way you do. But what I say is true. And we both realized it this morning. Father knows where I am living. You're Sam, spite of all, forever and always. P.S. Give Henry a lot of kisses from me. Well, we'll leave it at that. It's Glass of Berry Romance for today. See you around.